my, let me just to remind myself to turn it into something that you can relate to. So bridging to heart transplantation, um, of course, uh, is uh, something that has, uh, I think, that, that, that cannot be just, uh, just, uh, just viewed as, as it used to be. We have to put it into the wider context of where we live today. Brings us back to, um, to um, um, where we were before, as in uh, what the overall... Uh, does it work now? We seem to be getting someone. Is there any way of plugging it from the laptop directly to the laptop? No. Well, that's, that, that's exactly what it's doing. That is absolutely crashing. Give me two seconds. Another two seconds. So. Very well. Anyways, so so while while, while the overall numbers of, of uh, organ donors have has increased significantly, and there's great ado in the press about that, the overall numbers of Deceased brain dead donors has declined in the United Kingdom, and with uh, uh, this, uh, with about 25 percent of realization of what we do today, the question is, uh, what sort of bridging to transplantation should we do? Are we doing, and and what is our real true success rate? As in, is it a success if a patient uh, survives, or is it a patient? Is it a success if a patient really gets transplanted? In the end, what we need is a patient alive and well. So there is a political, and there are a couple of issues to that. Now. When you look at the overall situation, again, in the United Kingdom, or overall in the United Kingdom, more than 50% of our transplants are now being done in urgent patients. So this brings us back to a, a, a talk that we had in the previous session with uh, the results of patients coming into the hospital being transplanted off a ventricular assist device as a walk-in patient with abysmal long-term results uh, by small numbers when we compare that to the other groups. So should we transplant, should we do this, should this concept of bridging tra the transplantation on a longer-term device be, uh, be um, uh, thrown overboard altogether. And we have more than 40% now, when you look at worldwide transplantations, we have more, almost 40% of patients being transplanted are now transplanted off ventricular assist devices. So this is a truly, um, let's say, uh, a truly game-changing overall situation. Also, you have to keep, uh, in, in, you have to consider that when you look at the ISHLT data, even the ISHLT data, uh, transplanting somebody off a ventricular assist device is a significant risk factor. Please keep in mind that the ISHLT data are heavily influenced by the data from the United States, where a patient with a ventricular assist device gets a high urgent listing almost automatically and you can transplant them well whereas we specifically in the United Kingdom can only transplant these patients when they are urgent when do they become urgent usually when we have device severe device infections and this is why uh, this is not really happening when you look at the overall numbers transplantation of those devices of, of a device is, is a rare thing here a long-term device now so so that brings us to the theory the therapeutic concept uh, first of all, what, what can you bridge? You can bridge to transplant, short, you can bridge ultra short term, as in cardiogenic shock, as Steve has just uh, uh, shown us, uh, that's a, a bridge to decision or to further ther therapy. You can bridge short term, that would be somebody whom you bridge maybe on a short term device, like an ECMO or Levitronics device for a couple of weeks, try to get them um, the transplanted, or long term. And obviously, when you bridge longer term, you can bridge to myocardial recovery, um, the, uh, their, uh, uh, decision again or to transplant. In the United Kingdom, we are not allowed to, to bridge uh, uh, to what we call destination or we are not allowed to, to, to put in devices as chronic support therapy. But when you look at the overall, but when you look at the reality, when you put a patient on a device, this patient will not really get transplanted. So please keep that in mind. So what can we do? Now, what devices are available? There are these ultra short term and short term devices. Sorry. That's available and then we would start with uh, extracorporeal life support such as ECMO. This machine can run the specific setups for weeks and um, until uh, maybe a couple of months. Then you go into uh, short-term ventricular assist devices such as a uh, uh, electronics or um, oh, very good, you might do that. Or, yeah. or just choose one. Since it's an Apple computer, it should be well, it usually works. Look at this, amazing. Um, so, uh, so we have these uh, uh, ultra short-term devices here. Uh, we have uh, um, and we have long-term bats. 
I'll just go forward in the interest of time. Now, when, when, you, when you now look, look at ventricular assist devices that we all use to bridge to transplant per definition, there is a total artificial heart, which is probably the most aggressive version. This is time honored technology. These are Martin Struber's hands, by the way. Um, and it was one of our great successes in Hanover. We only did it once, and I think it is, well, there's a reason why it's not used very often. Uh, this is the mobile console, by the way. Uh, there is a smaller version of it too, but this is, is what you're lo really looking at. Then bridging to transplant with this one, the Thoratec Heartway 2, uh, the device, more than 10,000 of these are implanted. Uh, it is definitely a device that you can use to bridge to transplant, and we all know, or you, I'll show you some of the results, short-term to medium-term results are excellent, as in survival on the ventricular assist device. Third generation device, the hardware, again, is something that will give you short to medium term excellent results. And the last one uh, here is a Synergy micro pump. Uh, again, a device that, is, uh, that only provides partial support. It's a new concept. Um, it's definitely not for the crash and burn patient, but also designed as a bridge to transplant or maybe even as a longer term device. Now, the current results, when you look at this and you look at the best published results, you will see that in the United States, they have three years survival of 89%. Now, if you want to bridge somebody now with a longer term device to transplantation, and you have a three year survival of 89%, it is hard to justify the transplant operation. Within that, you, you really have to <coughs> start to compare medium to longer term results between the two. So the bridging concept, as it was, put in one of these devices and then transplant the patient off that device, Keeping in mind the, 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 the slide that some of you just have seen in the previous session, in the UK data, our data, Dr. Banner analysis, UK, plan, UK audit uh, uh, analysis, a 60% or even worse uh, uh, survival of patients, a 40% survival of the patients who are walking to the hospital and transplanted off that device. So that is a concept that we have to question. Now, what happens now if your patient is, a, is, is, is sicker and you really have to do something me, short to medium term? Then you have extracorporeal life support available. In the most aggressive version, it, should be, it could be implanted at another hospital under resuscitation. But as uh, we just heard, it might be used to tee your patient up. You have a patient with bad liver function, bad kidney function, and that might be something in order to, to change the, the odds before you do something else. These are systems that you can implant, veno-arterial ECMO. You see that this is implanted into the groin of the patient. You can implant it centrally. You can ambulate your patient around in the hospital. Materials have become better. You can run these systems up to, you know that patient, Martin, um, the, the, up to weeks to months now. But there are, of course, complications. Veno, uh, 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 um, uh, another veno-arterial ECMO setup. Again, you might notice there are many cannula here. There are more cannula actually than you need. And this is one thing you, for, if you plant it there, you need to look at for leg perfusion and there are all the other uh, all potential uh, uh, pitfalls attached to that, which is um, limb malperfusion, organ malperfusion. You can desaturate the, the brain, myocardial problems, all sorts of things. But it is something that you can use uh, as ultra short, actually, to now almost medium term. Now, there are other developments too, and one of these, for instance, is this here. It's uh, C pulse cuff counter pulsation, it's called the Sunshine Heart. Something when you look at it on the first moment, you think it's a rather strange device. It's basically an extra aortic balloon pump. It's got some quite interesting results to it. It's something that, that is air driven again, the wrap around the aorta. It provides a significant increase in cardiac output and reduction in afterload, just like a normal intra aortic balloon pump. It is similar. It is something, again, that you might use to bridge on a short to medium term basis. The company, of course, suggests that it might be millions of patients running around and using it on a long term basis, but that's probably not going to happen. Now look at this again, what happens when you put in a VAD, and I think the most important thing is here, ongoing survival, ongoing, the green ones, right? Um, when you look at the heart made two patients, 12 months down the road, uh, th th this is an, uh, an older study, even though it was published in 2011, these are the complete data, you see the transplant recovery or ongoing support remains quite high, and the patients on ongoing support 51% after 12 years, with a significant number of 34% transplanted. 34% transplanted, okay? This is what, what, what they wanted to do. The, the, the intent of this study was to transplant. But even in that particular setting, bridging to transplantation, you have 34% in one year. And then that's not really a successful setting of bridging to transplantation, I would say. Another study here showing uh, um, um, bridging to transplantation, or bridging, uh, short-term, medium-term, long-term, um, 
um, as a, as a, as a, as a, a flowchart for, for your uh, decision making. Um, and this is what happens when you look at the, uh, the uh, survival estimates of patients who got specific treatment, either myocardial recovery, orthotopic heart transplants, or long-term VADs who were treated with this particular, uh, with this particular uh, 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 flowchart, by this flowchart, and you will see that it looks quite nice, but when you look at the overall survival of all the patients, then you see that 365 days down the road of all your patients that you put into this flowchart, okay? you only have a 45% overall survival. Meaning that your flow chart that will give that, that the overall outcome is not too good. Now, if you choose the right patient, you're recovering or you're transplanting, you might have a good outcome. We, at Herfield, look, look at another uh, a device, uh, uh, here, heart, hardware, left ventricular assist device, patients with end-stage heart failure. Um, The mean duration of mechanical support, and the, what we did here uh, was that we, uh, wait, 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 where is it? The mean duration of, uh, no, uh, sorry, this is a wrong, I put in the wrong slide, sorry. Any, forget about that. What, what we, 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 we looked at our Levitronics results, and we could show that if you, again, put the right patient on a Levitronics, short to medium term, which is only a, which is a magnet, magnetically levitated uh, extracorporeal pump, that you can actually support them, tee them up, for transplantation or long-term ventricular assist device and be quite quite successful. Now, but again, one back to the reality. This is what you what we have in the United Kingdom. Medium waiting time to cardiothoracic transplantation, okay? Medium waiting time here is 253 days overall, but please look at the blood group O patients. Medium waiting time 741 days to transplantation. Okay, 741 days, and this is by far the largest group. These are the patients that we're supposed to be treating. These are the patients. And we do not list our patients in the United Kingdom. And you, Stefan, you can probably say we have discussions whether the patient actually goes on the list because it's not realistic that he will get a transplant anyways. And the ventricular assist device is not really an, 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 uh, an option. Um, couple of mild survival for heart made two. On a ventricular assist device, one more. 85% 12 months. And when you look at here again, now, our, our urgent versus non-urgent patients in the United Kingdom, 51 patients versus 47 patients transplanted off the urgent list. That's the clinical reality. That's the clinical reality. We do not transplant patients who are non-urgent any longer. We transplant patients who are urgent and not patients, and, and those are not the ones who are on ventricular assist devices. This is an old one, old slide that I always used to hate, and I always used to uh, uh, use this as in we should have the ventricular assist device and the transplantational therapy um, a lot move, 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 move it down their stairways. But bridging to transplantation has to be something that's got to be real. If you bridge somebody, you have to offer them the transplantation. Currently, with 751 or 750 days, if you're a black group or patients on the waiting list as a non-urgent patient with more than half of the patients being transplanted off the urgent waiting list, and with, I think, in the last financial year, about four patients or five patients in total being transplanted off long-term assist devices in the United Kingdom overall. That's the last number I have. You could, you, maybe you've done more, you can correct me. But I think we did two and you did two or something like that. So that, that is not really an option. So bridging, yes, but where to? And I have to say, um, that's an overall complex topic. So we have all these devices and systems available. We can bridge patients, or we can, we can bridge patients in a peripheral hospital with Stephen's uh, uh, ECMO service and NET that we're going to build up. We can bridge patients at our hospital with short to medium term devices um, and, and tee them up uh, to transplantation. We can list them as urgent patients and there's more data or that when you look at the, uh, and this is uh, when, you, when you look at the, the audit report, the 2000, and I advise you to do that, 2010, 2011, and the last one, 2011, 2012, you will see that one particular column is missing in that report, and that is the bad results. It's been taken out of the last audit report of uh, UKT. Now, I, if, I, if I may make a heretic or a provocative remark, I think that maybe the, the reason for this may be because it shows what the situation, it did show very clearly what the situation was in the United Kingdom, success of short-term and long-term bridging to transplantation with these devices, and it shows that we do not bridge to transplantation. We bridge short-term to either death or long-term device, or some of the patients may be transplantation, 
And once we are on a long-term device, we have effective destination therapy. So bridging to transplantation is a theoretical concept that is lovely as long as you have a heart available. But I think none of you should go home and think that this is really happening in the United Kingdom. You may have your one or two patients per year in your intensive care unit that you will actually bridge. But the other ones will end up on a long-term device and they will go home and they will wait for an extended period of time. That's the reality. Thank you very much.